Beasley Media Group, BMI, and HD Radio present another episode of How I Wrote That Song, where we go behind the scenes with some of the biggest hit songwriters of all time. Hi, I'm Sarah, and this is How I Wrote That Song. Today, we're talking to a singer-songwriter who's been ranked as one of the best in rock history since she made her debut in the 70s with her band Heart. And with Heart, she has sold over 35 million records, and she also has a wealth of solo material. She's been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and she is nominated for the Songwriters Hall of Fame. And she is a trailblazer for generations of women in many musical genres. We welcome Ann Wilson. Thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. So on this series, we highlight specific tracks throughout an artist's career. And I wanted to start not at the very, very beginning, but close to it with Barracuda. So uh, at the release of this song, it was 1977, Little Queen. And we had already heard Crazy on You and Magic Man. We were already well aware of your abilities as a songwriter and as a singer. But Barracuda is interesting because it's got this great grit to it. It's got teeth. What do you remember about composing that song? It was one of those songs that just came out of the the air. There was no real effort. Like I didn't have to sit there and belabor the words, you know, and figure out what I wanted to say. I, I had a, uh, a problem with somebody who had insulted me and my sister. And um, I was really angry. And so they just went down on the page, you know. Um, and then the the groove was actually, the guys in the band were playing around with that groove in sound check. And it just had this galloping driving thing about it that it it was perfect for the emotional um impact of the song it sounds like it was a very organic track totally yeah yeah didn't have to think too much about it just let my emotions flow (laughs) nice so when you write a song and maybe it's typical maybe it's not but do you prefer to have a a lyrical idea or a vocal melody in mind first and then put it to music? Or would you rather have some music that exists first and then put words to it? Um, Each song is different. They all happen. Each one happens in a different way. But generally, I will get an idea in my head from a phrase that I hear somebody say or I, I catch somehow in the ether. <clears throat> and then, like with the my solo band, the Amazing Dogs, um, they are incredible musicians that come up with these great musical ideas uh, just on their own, and um, that's been really inspiring for me. Is that your current band? Yes. Very yeah. cool. So after Barracuda and after Little Queen came Dog and Butterfly uh, the very next year. And mm-hmm. compared to a song like Barracuda, um, it's so delicate sounding, right? Yeah. Well, that was the thing about Hard is that it could go all places. It wasn't just like a heavy grinding rock band. It could do that for sure and have it be real, but... We also, uh, Nancy and I came out of a folk background Mm -hmm. and we came from a house with parents who listened to all kinds of stuff, Ray Charles and opera and operetta and uh, just all kinds of music. So it wasn't much of a stress for us to write something like um, Dog and Butterfly. Mm -hmm. I mean, Nancy at that time particularly was a beautiful acoustic player. and was really influenced by Paul Simon. Yeah. Yeah. You can um, hear that in that track in particular. Yeah. And so that was just, and at that time that that song was written, everyone we knew was reading Shogun, you know, the book Shogun. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. so there was an Asian influence in our whole camp. And, uh, and in the artwork too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and so that's where the uh, the story came from of the 
the young person going up to a like a guru mm -hmm. and getting getting a simple little just look at the dog and the butterfly. Yeah. So is there any truth to the legend that you you looked out the window and saw these two animals frolicking and that that imagery came yeah. to life? Yeah? Yes. At, at that time I had an old English sheepdog and she was just so playful and like a big Disney dog, you know, and she she just uh she was playing with the butterfly and of course she, she'd never catch it. But the butterfly was really mischievous and was playing with her and I thought that's that's a metaphor you know yeah see I would see that nowadays and be like oh that's a Pixar movie in the making but, but right yeah the song. <laughs> right um, so, well, were you living in Seattle at this time yes yeah you've spent most of your life in Seattle right yeah how would you say that place has influenced your songwriting well Seattle is a really good place for for artists because it's so dark and dreary so much of the year so you're you're inside a lot and you're looking for things to do and the creative outlet is is really a good place to put your energy through all the dark months so you know you're not out having fun in the sun necessarily you're at home reading or writing or painting or playing guitar it sounds uh, i've never been but it sounds contemplative it's beautiful nice yeah. i want to fast forward to the 90s where you had a side project with your sister called the love mongers mm -hmm. and you put out an album called whirly gig in 1997 and this came after a period of uh you know heart had been working for a while with some outside writers and co-writers and all of that. So what was it like to have this side project to get back into your own songwriting? Oh, it was liberating. It, yeah. it was our transition back toward our true selves from the more corporate 80s uh, pose that we had been posing as for the last few years. and. Uh, doing other people's songs, which, which as a singer, I never really got into because there was not that much depth involved. There was no real substance to those songs. They were more kind of stable writers, you know, the LA writer's pool sure. that, that was just writing for the radio. And, you know, once you start writing to get on the radio, you're not leading anymore. You're, f you're a follower. Mm -hmm. And um, that chapped my hide, you know? <laughs> sure, yeah. So, I think the other people in the band loved the 80s because they were playing guitars and synthesizers yeah. and it was more fun for them. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was, it was pretty flat. So the love mongers were a really great escape from that and coming back into our own. And we did a few of our own songs and we did a whole bunch of covers the Love Mongers was a vocal band, heavy harmonies. It was a gas. Nice. Well, with those songs, uh, and by those songs, I'm referring to the ones that you didn't have as, a, as much of a songwriting hand in, like um, I'm thinking of These Dreams and Alone from that 80s era. Um, th they became such huge hits, regardless of how you felt singing them. So how do you feel performing them now has it taken on any sort of meaning for you because you perform them so well i think that those two songs you mentioned were about the best two from that era um i think alone was a great song and <laughs> these dreams is a great song and what about love is a great song um so it wasn't completely without merit but um yeah those those are fun songs to sing that do really have some punch to them and, and uh, went over well live. Well, on your new solo album, which you released just this year, you have a mix of original material and also covers, which is really interesting to listen to. It's quite the journey as a, a full album. I absolutely love it. I was wondering about the song Black Wing. Can you tell us about that one? Yeah, um, Black Wing was written during the height of the pandemic, totally living in fear of catching COVID because it was bad. So nobody went out 
And um, it's just day after day after day, I was looking out the window at the, uh, my husband and I live on a river, mm -hmm. looking at the river and looking at the seabirds and everything that were around. And and uh, after an, a, a few months, I started talking to them <laughs> and and kind of bonding with them because they were out there free, you know? And um, so that's that's when I started writing Blackwing. Mm -hmm. We live out in the country and it seemed like we were isolated, not only because of COVID, but because of being so deep in the countryside, mm. not like we were on a, a asteroid or something. Yeah. And, um, in your own universe. I yeah. will say striking up conversations with animals sounds a lot better than, you know, talking to some inanimate object, which <laughs> during lockdown, I think a lot of people found themselves doing, right. but uh, that's, that's really beautiful. I mentioned that there are a handful of covers on this album. When you are trying to pick out a song that is already recorded, already out there, not your own. What do you look for in a cover song? What appeals to you? For me to get really excited about doing a cover, it has to have a real emotional impact that I can pour myself into because I feel on stage like um, that's what I'm there for is to really tell a story that has meaning and and depth so it has to have a real good story it has to have emotional impact and it's got to be um full of beautiful melodies and a song like forget her by jeff buckley mm -hmm. has got all that you know um love of my life the queen song beautiful Same thing yeah so beautiful uh, this year, you also collaborated with Disturbed on their new album, which is pretty cool. A song called Don't Tell Me. You yeah. and David Draymond, both vocal powerhouses. So it's another really fun listen. How did that collaboration come about? Well, they they got in touch with me and they they I think they were just sitting around one night and they were going, well, you know, Disturbed has never had a guest artist. Um. But if we were going to have one, who would it be? And somebody else said, well, somebody like Ann Wilson. And then somebody else said, well, let's just call Ann Wilson. So <laughs> they call me. And and uh, of course, I said yes right away because I'm a, I love Disturbed. I love yeah. David Freeman. I mean, he's such an intelligent singer. Yes. And just a, uh, he's like a almost Shakespearean um, and just has all this grit or tenderness, you know, and I love the way he says his words and it's just, it was really an honor to get to sing with him. Yeah. Like I said, a very cool track and a very cool surprise as I'm listening to this disturbing yeah. and the track, your name comes up. And I thought at first I was a little taken aback and then it's, you know what? This makes sense. This makes perfect sense. Cause like I said, both of you have this very operatic presence. It's it's a really great blend. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So next year, 2023, believe it or not, marks 50 years since the formation of Heart, the band that got all of this started. Do you have any plans to celebrate that milestone? Well, right now, um, not really. I mean, we're just we're just kind of doing our solo things right now and and uh I'm not one for big memorializing stuff you know I I think that it's going to be good just to just to let it live and um we are is it okay if I talk about the grammy yeah yeah we are um uh going to get a grammy for lifetime achievement this year wow so that's actually amazing yeah Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So that's one way to celebrate. Yeah, see that that seems like the ultimate way to me. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, and thank you so much for taking time out of the day. I see that you're uh, hard at work in the studio. Is there anything that you can tell us about that? Well, we're working on our me and the amazing dogs are working on our second album together. And so far we have about 9 or 10 songs 
that we all really like. And uh, we're going to write a couple more and then we're going to start tweaking them and hopefully have an album out. Wouldn't you say uh, nice. September, May? Sometime. September, yeah. Excellent. Well, very much looking forward to hearing that. And if you have not heard it yet, definitely go listen to Fierce Bliss. And thank you so much for talking about your upcoming projects and your legacy today. It's been an honor. Oh, well, thank you for having me.